Hello and welcome to Glasswire, the show that helps you to understand, appreciate and enjoy all aspects of the English language and literature. Today's episode is brought to you by Jack Hunt School, one of Peterborough City's leading 11 to 19 comprehensive schools. With specialist language college and sports specialist college status, Jack Hunt School offers a truly dynamic, vibrant and multicultural community for all your secondary educational needs. Today is Friday and you know what that means. Hello and welcome to Poetry Friday. In today's session, we're going to take a look at the poem If by Rudyard Kipling, which is one of the poems in the IGCSE Poetry Anthology. But first, a bit of background about Kipling himself. He was born in the British colony of India um, at the time when the country was ruled by the British Empire. His parents were English and he was sent back home to be educated in England and in that time he developed quite strong views about the British Empire and their rule of the world. Uh, he's probably most famous as a novelist and a short story writer, but he also wrote quite a considerable amount of poetry. He was a staunch supporter of British imperialism, um, which is perhaps unsurprising given his own personal background. And he wrote quite a number of tales and poems which were inspired by British soldiers serving in India. Perhaps you'll know him better as the author of the children's book, The Jungle Book. Now a little bit of background about the poem itself. Even though you don't need to write about it in the exam, I think it's helpful to really know about the background to the poem so you fully understand it. The poem itself was published in 1910 in a collection called Rewards and Fairies. In Something of Myself, which was published in 1937, one year after Kipling died, um, Kipling claims that his inspiration for the poem was a man called Leander Starr Jameson. Jameson was the 10th Prime Minister of the Cape Colony. Um, he was in charge of the British Empire's colony in South Africa. Um, again, this was during the heyday of British imperialism when the British Empire controlled large amounts of territory around the world. Jameson is best remembered as the leader of the Jameson Raid, which took place between December 1895 and January 1896. Jameson's men were trying to overthrow the Boer Republic, led by Paul Kruger, uh, because the Boers were occupying large parts of southern Africa, which contained rich mineral resources that the British colony um, were hoping to get access to. The raid itself was a massive disaster. A great number of men died, and Jameson's actions, unsurprisingly, drew a lot of criticism. Some even go so far as to say that Jameson's actions created the tensions which ultimately led to Great Britain and the Boers going to war but Kipling and respected him for staying true to his decisions and his actions even though his actions drew a lot of criticism from people in the Cape Colony and back in Great Britain. So the poem itself is um, a dedication to being your own man, having your own opinions and staying true to what you genuinely believe in. So let's take a look at it in more detail. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself, when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to, broken, and stoop and build them up with worn-out tools, if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose, and start again at your beginnings, and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch, 
If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Let's have a quick um, look at the perspective and tone taken in the poem. You'll have probably noticed already that the poem uses second person and it's structured like a father giving advice and recommendations to his child. Which is interesting because that puts the reader in the position of the child and we're listening to the persona giving the advice. So the tone as a result um, has a very advisory, caring and didactic tone to it. Um, Didactic meaning to teach a message offering advice and guidance and so on to the the young listener. The attitude of the poem, um, perhaps unsurprising considering it was published in the Victorian times, um, is very much one of stoicism. Victorian stoicism basically means not showing your emotions, being tough, you know, getting on with things, gritting your teeth and bearing it. Or as we would probably say these days, man up. So, let's have a look at the poem itself in a bit more detail, um, starting with the first stanza. The poem itself uses iambic pentameter. If you can keep your head when all about you. Well, what is iambic pentameter? Well, iambic pentameter just simply means that there are five feet in each line. Right, so an iam is an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. Let's have a look at the first line to make that a bit more clear. If you can keep your head when all about you. So you can see each of these pairs matches up. We have five iams. The line is an end stop. It rolls on into the next. So the you part is the unstressed syllable, which then partners with the, the first word in the second line. So iambic pentameter gives it a very conversational feel, which is in keeping with it being a, a conversation between a father and his child as he's offering the advice. The other thing you'll notice is that there is a very distinct structure. We have an A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D rhyme scheme. Um, What does that mean? Well, if you have a look, you have the word you rhyme with you, you rhyme with two, waiting rhyme with hating, lies rhyme with wise. Again, it just helps the conversational flow of the poem, but it's worth mentioning it. Let's have a look at the actual lines themselves in the first stanza and just uh, analyse those in a little bit more detail. So, the poem itself is called if, which is also the opening word, and if is a conjunction which introduces um, a conditional clause. Okay, now, in fact, the entire poem is a long list of several conditional clauses. These are all the different things that the boy must do in order to be considered a man. We get a lot of if clauses, one after another, um, which kind of emphasises the, yeah, the kind of the challenge, if you like, of what the boy must do in order to be a man. Now we've mentioned already there's a lot of use of you and your. So we have second person all the way through the poem, and that's consistent in all of the stanzas. And we have some examples there of the, the tone being advisory and didactic. I wouldn't go so far as to saying that these are imperatives. It's not saying make allowance, because, of course, it's all framed from this conjunction if. So if you make allowance, um, if you can wait. So these aren't orders or commands, but recommendations. But it is worth noting that because the if um, conjunction is separated from some of these different lines, they start to take on some of the qualities of an imperative Um, An imperative is those bossy verbs, those bossy commands that tell you to do something. So you could read these lines as make allowance, you know, wait, not be tired, don't deal in lies, and so on. However, the if clause does make it sound more like advice and kind of a didactic, teacherly kind of tone to it. So let's have a look at the actual lines themselves. If you can keep your head, what just means stay calm, don't panic, you know, keep cool. It's talking about keeping calm when everyone else is panicking and losing it. So it's all about what to do in the event of a crisis. It's telling you to trust yourself, have confidence and believe in what you you think is true. You know, it's telling people to listen to others, make allowance for their doubting. just means listen to what others have to say, but don't let it necessarily change your, your mind. Stay true to what you believe in. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, just means be patient. 
You know, waiting can be a good thing. It gives you time to think things through clearly. Being lied about, don't deal in lies, simply means have integrity. And integrity just means self-worth, uh, your kind of respectability, if you like. Don't behave badly just because others do. You know, stay true to yourself and be an honourable person. Don't give way to hating. It just means stay positive and don't behave like your critics do. You know, just because others are spreading rumours and lies about you doesn't mean that you should stoop to their level. The final line in the stanza is a bit of advice suggesting that, you know, don't be too arrogant. You know, be modest. Don't show off. You might be talented and you might be smart, but don't show those things off because it can make people feel small and it can work against you. So be a modest person. Okay, let's have a look at stanza two. Okay. Well, again, we've got the A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D rhyme scheme. Master rhyming with disaster. Aim rhyming with same. Spoken with broken. Fools with tools. Okay. So there is consistent um, structure of the whole poem. Again, creating that kind of conversational flow as the father talks to his son. Now we start to see some of the more interesting structural features appearing in this um, particular stanza. You know, it's suggesting that we should, you know, have dreams, have ambitions and goals. But this dash introduces um, a separate clause saying, you know, don't make dreams your master. Just means don't lose sight of your, your reality. You know, don't be naive. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim, simply means plan, think about your options. But don't let thinking paralyze you. So the dash here adds this conditional cause, which just means don't sit around all day thinking about what you want to do. You need to get on and just get stuck in and do it. You need to act. Interestingly, here we have triumph and disaster, both with capital letters, which suggests that we've got some personification. It's almost as if we have this um, idea of a, a journey in life. So you meet these two characters on your way and you should ignore them. This idea that the noun imposters suggests that they are fake, that they're not something you can trust. So you shouldn't be distracted by success or failure, success being triumph, failure being disaster, because they're essentially the same and they don't last. They're both things that will pass quite quickly in your life. So you should keep going on with things, um, keep looking towards the future. If you can bear th to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, just means that sometimes other people will twist the words you've said to suit their own ends, and you shouldn't let that get to you. The word knaves just means a dishonest man. It's quite an old-fashioned word, we don't hear it very often. Or watch the things you gave your life to you broken and stoop and build them up with worn-out tools. Well, this bit just means be prepared to start again and do the best you can, fix what you can, uh, and get on with it. Don't let, you know, don't let setbacks stop you from continuing with your life, and don't let failures, which the word broken suggests, don't let failures in life stop you from trying to achieve your dreams. We have the word stupid, which just means to, to bend down. It's an interesting verb because it suggests this idea of being humble, stooping, bending forward. Um, it means kind of you know being modest and humble and getting on with things. And don't be too proud to start from the beginning, basically. Um, the word stoop can have other connotations. It's sometimes it could be used to mean to kind of be immoral, stoop to a very low level, go behind people's backs. But considering the overall tone of this poem, I very much doubt that's what um, Kipling's persona is recommending that people should be immoral um, because the rest of this poem is, is about having integrity and being honourable and good. So clearly the stoop here simply means to you know, not be too proud to kind of start over again, bend down to a low level and begin from the very beginning. Let's have a look at stanza number three. Again, we've got the A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D rhyme scheme. We have winnings rhyme with beginnings, toss with loss, sinew with you, gone with on. Again, as I've been saying all the way through, we just have that kind of conversational tone to the poem provided by its structure. Make one heap of all your winnings is a kind of a gambling reference. It's talking about the kind of the heap um, being a kind of your pot of money. And it's this idea of taking a chance in life, being prepared to take risks, you know, making one heap, suggesting putting everything in the middle of the table and being prepared to gamble everything um, to take a chance in life. 
Um, we get the kind of the gambling imagery extended here with pitch and toss, which is an old fashioned game. It takes kind of various forms. Um, the French play a game with balls where you throw you know, balls at a, a target ball and try and get the closest to it. Um, in America, they play kind of a version of it called horseshoes, where you try and get a horseshoe to go around a target. This idea of throwing an object at the target, trying to get it as close as possible to win. So it's this idea of a game of skill and chance. Um, and Kipling is using it here as this kind of imagery of gambling and taking risks and saying, you know, it's a good thing to take a risk, even if there's a chance you might lose. And in fact, this is what he starts to talk about here. And lose and start again at your beginnings. This idea of never quitting, you know, even if everything goes wrong and you lose it all, be prepared to start from the beginning and not give up. Don't quit. Um, an interesting structural feature starts to take place now. Uh, we see repetition of the conjunction and. And I guess this is the um, design to emphasize the importance of these things. He emphasizes the importance of gambling, taking risks and not giving up, you know, not being put off by um, taking those risks. Never breathe a word about your loss while well, it's simply not complaining and moaning to others when things don't work out and trying to maintain positivity and, and being kind of self-sufficient, not looking to others to comfort you when things go wrong. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone. Well, we have a triple here, heart, nerve and sinew. And this idea of, you know, you've got to keep trying even when you're tired, even when you're exhausted and you think you've got no more energy left. You've just got to keep going no matter what. And in this case, the repetition of and is designed to kind of emphasize the kind of the level of exhaustion, you know, your heart and nerve and sinew. So no matter how exhausted you are, you've got to keep going. And so hold on when there's nothing in you just simply means being strong and toughing it out, even when things aren't necessarily going your way. Um, accept the will which says to them, hold on. Interesting thing here, a bit like we saw with Triumph and Disaster, we have the word will capitalized here, which would suggest that we've got more personification. Um, perhaps it's the idea that you need to become will itself. You need to see your plan through to the end. You need to rise to it. Uh, and interestingly, that we have the pronoun them. So it's not so much about necessarily inspiring, encouraging yourself and telling yourself to keep going, but perhaps being a role model to others and inspiring other people, them, to hold on, to keep going. So this idea of being a leader, encouraging and inspiring others to keep going even when you yourself almost have nothing left. Okay, stanza four. Well, again, the A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D rhyme scheme, virtue of you, touch and much, minute and in it, run and sun. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, well, that just means, you know, be social, do kind of interact with the crowd, talk to people, but don't let your social group lead you into doing bad things. So keeping your virtue is kind of keeping your honor and integrity intact. Don't be corrupted by the bad things that other people around you might be doing. Walking with kings nor losing the common touch. Well, this is the idea that as you become a success in life, you might rise in status. You might get to walk with a king or meet other successful, rich and powerful people. But even if that happens, you shouldn't lose the common touch. You've got to remember your roots, where you come from. Don't let social status fool you into thinking you're more than, than you are. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, simply means don't let others hurt you. Rise above their comments. You know, being sort of strong. Again, it goes back to that idea of Victorian stoicism. You know, if all men count with you but none too much simply means, you know, being dependable, letting people count on you. But none too much simply means don't let other people take advantage of you. Don't let them rely on you so much that you're doing all of the work. If you can fill the other giving a minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, simply means make good use of your time, be effective. And the final lines, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Uh, it's basically saying that if you do what I suggest, you'll be a success in life. You'll have everything that's in the world, everything that you want. An interesting feature, again, we have another one of these embedded clauses being embedded using a pair of dashes. And this is, I guess, Kipling's persona emphasizing that this is his view of what's important in life. This idea of being a true man. This is the kind of core idea, being a true man, being a success is secondary to this idea of being a man with integrity and honor and this stoic attitude and you know, basically manning up. Okay, in terms of themes and links in the poem, well, the most prevalent, of course, is the theme of advice and guidance in the parent-child relationship. 
Okay, in terms of the themes and links for the poem F, well, the most common theme you'll find in this, of course, is that of advice and guidance. You have a father offering advice to his son so that he can become a man and live a good, productive and happy life. In that sense, you've also got the theme of parent and child relationships, which runs for a number of the poems in the RGCSE anthology. In that sense, you can link the poem If by Rudyard Kipling to a number of poems in the collection. Uh, In terms of the theme of of advice and guidance, you could link it to the poem by Dylan Thomas, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, in which he kind of explains his views on how you should live your life um, to the fullest. You could also link it to the poem Once Upon a Time by Gabriel Acara. In that poem, you have a father talking to a child as well and offering their views and their advice. However, Acara's poem is much, much darker, much more negative, so it presents a nice contrast. Uh, Vernon Scannell's poem, Hide and Seek, also has um, an older uh, persona talking to a young child. Although in that particular poem, it's not clear if the older persona is actually um, the child later on in life, looking back and talking to their y- a younger version of themselves. So it's not quite a parent-child relationship, but you still have that dynamic of the adult talking to a child. So you can still compare it on some levels. Either way, there are a number of poems you can connect this one to, um, depending on the kind of argument you're trying to construct. Be sure to check out Christopher Emerson's smash cut version of Rudyard Kipling's poem, If. I'll post a link in the comments section below. Be sure to check it out. If nothing else, it's an incredible bit of editing. As always, if you found this revision resource useful, then click on the like and subscribe and tell your other classmates about it too. Bye for now.